Hey, we're glad you're here this evening. Why don't you uh, join me and we'll sing a couple songs together. Uh, we're going to sing that one she's been playing through, 343. We'll work till Jesus comes. Thanks for being here at midweek. Let's sing all three verses together this familiar song. O oh, land of rest for the ice, I when will the moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home? We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home to Jesus Christ I fled for rest he bade me cease to roam and lean for sugar on his breast till he conduct me home we'll work till Jesus comes we'll work till Jesus comes we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home on that last I sought at once my Savior side no more my steps shall roam with him I'll break this chilling tide and reach my heavenly home we'll work till Jesus comes we'll work Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Amen. You know, the world treats work as just such a, a dirty thing. You know, what's interesting in the Bible, work was there before the curse of sin and works there. And we're going to work through eternity, right? Serving and praising Christ. And so we'll get used to it. Page number 357, work for the night is coming. You can see the theme on the midweek here. We'll sing all three verses here together. Work for the night is coming. Work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work mid springing flowers. Work when the day grows brighter. Work in the glowing sun. Work for the night is coming when man's work is done. Work for the night is coming. Work through the sunny noon. Fill brightest stars with labor. Rest comes sure and soon. Give every flying minute something to keep in store. Work for the night is coming when man works no more. Work for the night is coming under the sunset skies while the bright tents are glowing work for daylight flies work till the last beam fadeth fadeth to shine no more work while the night is darkening when man's work is o'er Thank you, and you may be seated this evening. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. We've got uh, about 12 or so out uh, tonight, uh, and they will be for next several weeks uh, in our financial uh, uh, peace class. And so uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, all the different things that are happening on the property. Uh, if you, as you came in, perhaps you got some ice cream already, and uh, the teens are taking care of that. If you did not, they also are going to be uh, open and available after service, and uh, so that's what you need at 8.30. So, hey, we at least got one customer there. So uh, that is uh, for the teens, five bucks uh, for an ice cream sundae, funding uh, some different things that they've got going on here at the end of school into the summer. Got a couple of things to tell you about. Uh, our kids' uh, baptism month is this month uh, for the entire month uh, of April here. And so I want to let you know about that. And uh, so we've got uh, some uh, uh, kids that are going to be uh, taking that next step 
and following the Lord in believer's baptism. Uh, we have uh, two that got saved on Sunday that will be uh, getting baptized uh, on this uh, uh, Sunday coming up as well. And so praise the Lord for that and uh, really good stuff. And uh, also as our, our uh, kids department teaches on that and talks about that and, and uh, works with kids on salvation and baptism, uh, be praying for that in this month. Uh, also, our revival is this month uh, as well. And at the end, April 28th to May 1st, that's um, a, not this Sunday, but the next will be the start of that. And we're excited to have in two different uh, speakers and preachers for us during this time. And so be here for that. It'll be concluding on Wednesday, two weeks from tonight. Uh, and, uh, but if you just come then, you'll have missed the whole, uh, the whole thing before that. So Sunday morning, uh, Sunday night. Monday night and Tuesday night as well. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, great guys, good uh, preachers, and I know that you'll be blessed uh, to be here for that. Uh, services on Sunday are at the same time that they always are. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they'll all start at 7 o'clock. That way we allow folks who are working to be able to get in. I know some of you have a tight uh, timeline to make it here for church, and we appreciate uh, your uh, faithfulness um, to that as well. Uh, also wanted to let you know uh, we have, uh, during that same week, uh, illusionist David Korn coming in. Uh, he is a, uh, a Christian, goes to a church in Houston, and a church exactly like ours. In fact, he, uh, that gr uh, lady there, Joy, is um, Josh Winstead, our uh, children's pastor's sister. And uh, so they travel all around the country and have been all around the world. Uh, and they go into public schools and uh, have uh, uh, an illusion show. And then at the end, he's able to uh, give a uh, talk into the public schools uh, on different uh, subjects, character related and things. And then also we're going to have on Thursday night, Friday night and Saturday night here uh, on those dates there, May 2nd, 3rd and 4th, a show inside our church and then we'll be able to give the gospel at the conclusion of each one of those shows. And so uh, they have uh, a lot of, uh, we're, we're gearing up for this. We have a lot of, uh, of uh, tickets that we give to the kids that gets their family in. It's all free. We want to be able to just give out the gospel to a lot of people uh, in that week. And so uh, because of that, you can see all the different times there and everything. If you would like to help on that, uh, we, we are signing up and taking uh, help for it. So here's what you can do if you're interested at all. We're going to be in five different public schools during that week, as you can see at the top, from Tuesday, April 30th to Friday, May the 3rd. And uh, there's a school a day, and one of the, the, one of the days has uh, a morning and an, and an afternoon. If you have availability during the day, on either Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, and you would like to help us to get into the public school, we'll just be helping to set up some of the staging stuff, and then as the kids are leaving, we're giving them a ticket to say, hey, if you want to come, there's going to be another, there'll be a, a longer extended free show uh, at our church on these days. And so if you have any availability during the day, uh, Tuesday through Friday, as you can see the dates there, uh, then we, we want to be able to uh, get you involved in that, and we'd love uh, to have your help. And so if that's you, if you want to uh, just text me or see me, uh, we can get you signed up for that. Then in the evenings, if you don't have day daytime availability, which I know most people don't, uh, on Thursday evening, Friday evening, and Saturday evening, the shows here at the church start at 6.30. And so if you can be a help uh, in one of those or uh, all three of them if you want to, you could come every, every one of them, uh, please let me know as well. Uh, we're going to need about 20 people on Thursday, 20 on Friday, 20 on Saturday to be able to uh, help it run, get folks in here, uh, do what we need to be able to do. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be great. And we're praying for many, many folks to hear the gospel and uh, to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so that's what we'll be doing in a couple of weeks here. So if you can do that, if that applies to you, if you can help in any way at all, please uh, see me about that. Uh, daytime availability, nighttime availability. We want to be able to use you. We've got a spot for you, so please uh, let me uh, know if that's the case. Uh, our missions uh, spotlight that we have uh, this evening is for the Keith uh, Stensis family, and it's on the front of your bulletin there. I'll do that at this time. If you did not get a bulletin coming in, if you found a way to uh, slip and uh, kind of covertly get around the guys as you're coming in, then they want to be able to give you a bulletin. And so just raise your hand right there. If you didn't get one on the way in, uh, you'll need that all the way throughout the night. And uh, did they get everybody full coverage? Look at that. All right. Gold star, guys. Good job. So uh, we've got Keith Stensis, and his uh, dad was actually a missionary, uh, Brian Stensis, decades uh, in Africa. And he's uh, uh, going, he's there now as well, uh, going on uh, many years also. And so he's our missionary there. We have this update for him 
This is the first week of January. Uh, we held our triannual Bible Institute here at the uh, Masaka Independent Baptist Church with 58 pastors and church leaders in attendance. We are privileged to have missionary Caleb Turner teach on the subject of the biblical philosophy of music in a world where people, even some of God's people, have an immoral view of music. It was a blessing to see from a Bible perspective how to discern between godly, Christ-honoring music as opposed to self-glorifying and worldly music. We recently loaded up our vehicle and drove to the village of Kiwanji in the Rosindi the Ruin Zori Mountains, uh, where a church is beginning or is being started by an uncle uh, of one of our leaders. We had a full day of services with over 60 people in attendance and eight adults coming to the Lord uh, and Christ as their Savior. Uh, please pray uh, for uh, Crispo and his family as he leads this group of believers. We're planning on a baptismal service there in the month of March. So we received this letter uh, in February and so. Uh, they've already had that now. February was the start of our first term of the year of Masaka Baptist uh, College with 12 Bible college students. I'm teaching through the subjects of pastor and pastoring and homiletics. Already I've heard testimonies as, we, as to how the classes have impacted their lives. We also had our first term of the Barnabas uh, Baptist Bible Training Center in uh, Caliro. 26 pastors and leaders attended as I taught the course called Dangerous Calling, uh, emphasizing the call of God in a pastor's life, knowing that you're calling and the dangers that are involved in the ministry uh, in that calling. Please keep these men uh, in your prayers as we work with these 23 churches and getting them established in maturity and Bible purposes. Uh, while in Caliro, I had the opportunity of visiting uh, churches in Natwana and uh, Gadumuri. Uh, that we've been working with to get permanent structures built. God has blessed both these churches in making uh, bricks and collecting the eucalyptus poles necessary for the roof trusses. Uh, we were able to help them uh, by purchasing uh, cement, sand, and iron sheets for the roofs. They are overjoyed at the current buildings they have to meet in. Despite the torrential rains that morning, a great crowd of people arrived to open the doors to their new building. It's such a blessing to see these churches mature in the faith uh, as well as get permanently established in their communities. Uh, I want you to write this one thing down uh, for them. Obviously, there's a lot going on with the work, a lot of different things we could pray for, but one specific they're asking for us uh, to record, and that is please pray for our 10-year residency permits to be approved. And in some countries, that can take a long time. In some countries, uh, they're kind of corrupt about it and such, but uh, if they can get those approved, then they'd be able to continue on there for uh, several more years. And so that's the 10-year residency permits that need to uh, be approved. Okay, um, that is our missionary, uh, our missions moment and spotlight there uh, for the Keith Stensis uh, family. Okay, we're going to have our um, offering at this time. And uh, two weeks in a row now, we're, we're trying to take care of uh, needs here. And uh, there was a, uh, a death that happened, as we told you, on Sunday. Um, in uh, Victor's family, actually his brother, uh, just late 50s uh, passed, and uh, so we were praying for, for them and for that, and uh, the funeral is coming up this Saturday at the church at 10 a.m. If you'd be praying for that, um, there'll be a lot of lost folks here. So we want to be praying for that. So we want to try to help with um, some funeral expenses uh, that the family is uh, trying to absorb and deal with and things like that. And so if you could help in any way, be a part of that, I know it'd be a blessing. And uh, again, that funeral is this Saturday at 10 a.m. at the church. Anyone is invited to come. And so we want you here for that, be able to support uh, for Victor and Leticia, 10 a.m. at the church on Saturday. Uh, and so that's what it's for, uh, for the funeral expenses. And uh, don't forget, we have a new giving platform as well uh, to be able to uh, donate to. And so they'll have that on the screen for you, uh, both uh, in-house and online as well. Text gift to that number right there. You can get set up to do that as we're migrating over to this giving platform. It'll save the ministry and put uh, more money back into God's work. And uh, that's what we're all about. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll take up our offering um, this evening. Dear Lord, we love you, God, and just thank you. Uh, Lord, for the good report that we got from the Stensis family. Lord, thank you for all the work that they're doing and training. It sounds like they're trying to dig the foundation really deep, Lord, of having a lot of people trained to be able to go out and to reach, Lord. So thank you for that, God. Help us to be able to, uh, as we're continuing to be a part of that work, Lord, through our giving, Lord. Help us to be consistent, faithful into our tithes and offerings, Lord, just giving back into your work. 
Uh, Lord, I pray that you might help for uh, the Torres family during this time and their extended family as well, God. Help us to be a blessing uh, to them, God. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Something about that name. Amen. That's a good one. Okay, we're going to take some prayer requests at this time. And so uh, if you um, have any of those, you can go ahead and text in there. Um, appreciate so much. You guys are getting early start and folks are uh, texting them in throughout the day on Wednesday. And then as they're heading to church, I can tell they're starting to text them in. And so I really, really appreciate uh, all of that. And so if you have any prayer requests, uh, go ahead and get those started coming in here. And uh, I've got uh, already seven to give you, and so I want you to be able to uh, write these down if you could uh, so that we can be praying for them together uh, as a church, and uh, certainly we know that we want to be able to lift those uh, needs up. The first one uh, comes from uh, Felicia, and uh, just wanted to pray for her mom. Her mom's name is Marie, and so she's had a, a headache here and uh, things that have gone on for two weeks won't go away, and it's getting worse. And her liver has also been having issues since August, and it's gotten specifically worse, or significantly worse, and the doctor is concerned um, because she doesn't drink at all, and so uh, they don't know what's going on there. So she has uh, a brain MRI and then also a liver scan on Tuesday uh, to try to figure out what's going on there. So her name is Marie, and I would just pray for her under health there, uh, several different things going on. And uh, again, that's Felicia's uh, uh, mother here with both her liver and then also uh, uh, also with uh, these different headaches that have been uh, happening and going on with her. Um, next, if you could pray for, um, there's a young man, this is from Monica Boggs, by the name of uh, Nick. She doesn't indicate exactly his age, but just a younger man. And uh, he uh, had a heart attack and uh, he had a stent put in today. And so just praying for his recovery on that. Uh, his name is Nick, and we're praying for him uh, with a heart attack. Um, also, uh, this is from the Willis family. Please write this down. Um, Nathan Willis uh, in, is going into surgery in 10 days to remove a, a growth uh, quite large, and uh, they're praying that it's non-cancerous and that uh, that goes okay. And so that's Nathan Willis, and just be praying for him as he'll have that surgery in uh, 10 days time for Nathan Willis. Um, okay, let's get to new ones that have come in here. Uh, praying for um, Jacob Hibbard's mission trip this summer. Uh, yes, thank you from the Hibbards. So that's for uh, Jacob Hibbard. He is going to um, Canada uh, this summer. And so just be praying for that. I believe he stays there about two months or so. And so just be praying for uh, him as that's coming closer. Uh, he's doing some fundraising and we'll need to do more fundraising in order to be able to, to do that. Uh, but great heart for serving the Lord. Jacob Hibbard uh, as he uh, is going through uh, that. Okay, um, next here uh, we have a prayer request uh, from uh, Andrea Ponce. 
uh, pray for El Figo, continued recovery from pneumonia, and um, also be praying for Philip and Amanda um, for their marriage, and uh, just really need a miracle there. And so be uh, praying for Philip and Amanda, and um, thank you for bringing it up uh, again and again, Andrea. I really appreciate that. And then also uh, for Tim Cornell, uh, he has a, uh, had his first chemo treatment today, and um, so uh, we'll be able to have all of these added on uh, to the prayer list. I've got quite a list working for that. So next Wednesday, you'll see everything uh, come updated here. So Tim Cornell has cancer, and he had the first round of chemo treatments in today. Okay. Um, Amy Rodriguez uh, said, uh, it's a praise report. Uh, my grandpa, Johnny Sanchez, has had a procedure just recently. Um, an ablation and his uh, atrial flutter uh, have, has been corrected, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, God has been so merciful to him through COVID in November, which led to a serious weakness in the fall, uh, which led to hip replacement, a month in rehab, hospitalization for his heart. He's 88 years old and still here with a brand new hip and a fixed heart, all thanks to Jesus. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, Amy Rodriguez, we are so thankful for your grandpa. That's Johnny Sanchez, and uh, praise the Lord for that. And uh, thank you for sending in the, the prayer request and the praises. Uh, that's awesome. So praise the Lord. Okay. Um, also here, this is from Sarah Falanga. Uh, please pray for my dad. Uh, unspoken prayer. Thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, for Sarah's uh, dad. Uh, they were on a trip a couple of weeks ago. And so uh, we're praying for her dad for an unspoken uh, now as well. Okay. I believe just one more. Uh, here, nope, two more. Uh, Alfigo um, Moya. Uh, okay, he's praying also for Philip and Amanda's uh, marriage, as Andrea said. So be praying for that again, Philip and Amanda, for their marriage. And then uh, Roddy Leader here, uh, praying uh, for Ross Adams. Uh, and Steve has been praying for that as well. Prayed for it on Saturday. We pray for it again today. Uh, just needing to get a different car situation. And so be praying. Uh, much for that. That's for Ross Adams uh, and for a vehicle situation uh, there. Thank you guys for lifting one another up in prayer. That's a, that's a huge blessing. Um, okay, that looks like everything that I have come in at this time. Uh, we'll go ahead and pray for these needs. If anything else comes in, uh, pray for it. We'll pray for it as well. Um, and as we're taking these needs to the Lord in prayer, if you're, if you're uh, watching this here or if you're in-house in here, let's all just take a moment to pray for these needs. And uh, if you're able to write some down, that's great. If you didn't bring a pen and you didn't, uh, just I'll be praying along as we do that. Yeah, and if you don't mind, um, so thank you for Miss Christiana. The uh, poolers are out of town and uh, their vacation, I think they... Uh, are uh, celebrating at Disney World, I think, or Land, or one of those ones, Land. There you go. And um, I don't know which is which, but we're, we're thankful for uh, Christiana stepping up in their absence uh, to be able to play this evening. So altars are open, and uh, pray here, pray there, wherever you're at, uh, praying at home. Let's just pray, to these, uh, pray these needs uh, to the Lord right now and uh, take them up collectively as a church body. Dear Lord, we love you, and uh, God, we want to just lift up these needs for you and uh, start, Lord, with a prayer or with a praise. And thank you for Johnny Sanchez, uh, for Amy's uh, grandpa, Lord. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, for the hip getting fixed. And Lord, what a, a, a six month span he's had since November to now, Lord. But thank you, thank you for a fixed hip, Lord. Thank you for a heart that's working, and uh, Lord, a better. And Lord, at 88 years old, thank you for the strength that you've given him. Uh, to uh, to endure, Lord, and to uh, serve you, Lord. I pray that you might just help him. Thank you for his life, God. Thank you for the health of it, Lord. Help for Jacob Hibbert uh, for this mission trip, and I pray that you would just lift him up, and thank you for his ability and opportunity to be able to go at this time. God, please help for that, Lord. Help for uh, El Figo with the pneumonia, and, and uh, Lord, he, uh, Lord, he prays for other people, and he's such a blessing, God, and uh, Lord doesn't bring up praying for himself. And so, Lord, thank you for a daughter uh, bringing it up tonight, Lord, and several times in the last couple of weeks. Pray that you might help him to be able to get over this, God, just months and months now of fighting uh, to, to get fully healthy, Lord. Please help for Philip and Amanda for their marriage, Lord. And uh, please just work and sustain and intervene, Lord. And God, there would be need to be a lot of, uh, Lord, um, uh, moving there on your part, Lord God, and awakening, God, and, and, and uh, Lord God, uh, work that you need to do. And so we pray for that, God. We know you're able. And so we pray for that, Lord. And uh, Lord, please bless a, a praying sister and dad, Lord, and family at this time too, God. Please help for Ross and for the vehicle situation, God. And thank you for 
his consistency and faithfulness to you. It's for his love for you and a love for his class and for those guys and uh, so many things there, Lord. I pray that you might just help, uh, Lord, and just uh, work something in a mighty, mighty way, Lord, uh, in his behalf, God. Lord, please help for Sarah's, uh, Sarah Falinga's dad, for the unspoken, Lord, and uh, just help and work in his life now, God. Lord, we pray for the Student Life Center and the things that need to go forward on that. And I pray that you would just uh, work and intervene there, God, in a big way. But I pray that you might give us, uh, Lord, discounts and deals and, uh, Lord, uh, people in our life, Lord, and just help everything as it goes forward, Lord. I know some things can hold up and take uh, many, many weeks. Parts can be delayed, Lord. I know there's a lot of things that can happen, and Lord, we know that you're able. So we put it in your capable, uh, very, very good hands, Lord. And so I pray that you might just help for that, Lord, as we try to go forward, God. Lord, please help for the churches in our area, in our state, Lord, all across Albuquerque, God. Uh, Lord, and into Kansas, Lord, with Alan Calgren and Jasper Whiston in Rangeley, Colorado, Lord, my father-in-law in San Antonio and Brother Barlaman in Colorado as well, God, Kyle Pope in Round Rock, Texas, God. Lord, we need churches to be strong and be preaching, Lord. Help for Horizon Baptist Church, Lord, as we uh, endeavor, Lord, as they've had their very first uh, uh, preview service there, Lord. I pray that you might just help for that uh, work as well to be able to go forward in a mighty way and to use them, God, uh, in infancy here, Lord, but what plans you have for them, God. Please up for Andrew Unger and Matt Stidham and Mark Stoffaker and uh, Chris Rogers as well, Lord. God, please help for our city, and I pray that you might keep a hedge of protection upon Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Lord, help us to be a light here, God. Uh, Lord, other churches here as well, Mesa, other uh, good churches, Lord, that you'd be able to just be with them, Lord, help for their pastors, and help us to be, uh, Lord, unified in giving out the gospel, Lord, and telling people of their need uh, to be saved, God. Lord, please help for the long list of people. Uh, every single one of us knows someone affected by uh, cancer, Lord, in some way. Lord, that's why we're so thankful, Lord, for the great report from Norm Sloan, God, and the recovery, Lord, as well for Miss Crystal, Lord. Help for this now for um, Nathan Willis. And uh, Lord, I pray that you might just help for the removal to go smooth, Lord, and then just please use and, and help, uh, Lord, for this to be a good report as well, God. Uh, please help for Tim Cornell. Uh, Lord, with his cancer and the chemo are associated with that, God. Please help for Marie, Lord, and a lot of things going on uh, with her, Lord, for her liver. And I know the doctors don't know and they'd be able to get an opportunity to look. But God, I pray that you might just heal her, Lord. And even tonight, God, as we pray collectively right now, I pray that you might take away this headache and, Lord, just start to give her relief there, Lord. And you're able. God, we pray specifically for that, God. And so we pray for Marie and to help them to be able to quickly uh, resolve and, and uh, bring this uh, uh, Lord, uh, good change into her life, God. Please help for Nick, this young man with the heart attack. Pray that you might just help him, Lord. God, help for those in the military, for Travis and Hunter, Lord, and Max, and Adam Bryan as he's uh, and his family have moved, uh, Lord, to uh, Louisiana, God. And please help for Ralph Houghton and uh, Christiana in Japan, and we certainly miss them and what good people, Lord. Isaiah Valenzuela, pray that you might just, uh, Lord, work and help in, in their life as well, God. Please uh, bless for the service tonight, Lord. Help all that we do to be uplifting and glorifying to you, Lord. We love you. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you so much for praying. Thank you so much, uh, Christiana, as well. Um, we've got uh, this evening, um, we're looking and uh, we're closing in. We've said now for several weeks, we're closing into the very, very end of 2 Corinthians. And uh, as our uh, discipleship group uh, heads out and uh, be in prayer for them, if you'd like to get into New Life Discipleship, uh, 13 weeks, get grounded more in your faith and uh, get the, uh, that strength and that uh, partnership uh, of a discipler. Uh, we encourage you uh, f in that and for that. And actually, I think we're just about two or three weeks away from having a graduation uh, of two people from that. And so we're looking forward to that. That's always exciting to watch people uh, maturing and growing, taking steps of faith. It is so awesome uh, to hear, hey, someone got saved down here at the altar after church or uh, with Brother Josh, you know, back there or, uh, over in the module with the teens. And uh, there's a lot of different rooms, a lot of different places around this property where someone can come to Jesus Christ. And that's awesome. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, we've seen, I believe now, 18 baptisms in the last three weeks here, uh, starting with Easter. So praise the Lord for that. And, and watching people take steps of faith is to me the most exciting thing. It's, it's awesome, it's incredible. And so watching people graduate uh, uh, from starting point in a couple of weeks here on Mother's Day, we'll have a baby dedications and, and watching those uh, new blessings into the world, uh, right? As we just say, Lord, these are, these are your blessings and we, we give them to you. So that's all incredible stuff. Uh, Pastor and, uh, uh, and uh, Ms. Lentine have made it to um, 
uh, Oklahoma City is where they're at. And uh, so on, on the U-Haul uh, journeying all the way back. And uh, so their plan is to be able to be back in tomorrow night sometime uh, in, the, in the evening or whatever, about nine hours or so uh, from uh, Oklahoma City uh, in a U-Haul. And so just be praying uh, for them as they're on the very last leg of their journey, uh, which means on Sunday morning, uh, you get to hear pastor. And so we're so excited for that. So we were talking around here, one of our staff, they said, man, uh, I just, uh, you know, really miss, uh, I can't wait till pastor comes back, you know, and, and I've really been missing him and that kind of thing. And uh, hearing him preach and such. And they, they immediately said, they're like, not, th not that you guys are doing a bad job. I mean, it's good. You know, we just, we just really get used to and want to have pastor. I said, I, I agree. A wholeheartedly, I agree. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. Be here on Sunday. We're continuing our series uh, that we've been in in Colossians and uh, the main thing. And so we'll pick up in Colossians 2 uh, this Sunday with Pastor. Okay, last week we looked at uh, Paul's uh, final defense and kind of looking in, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 is where we're going to be. And uh, wanted to have a, a really great title uh, for this. And that's as a pastor, you know, they always teach you uh, when you're learning how to, to make a sermon and everything. Uh, it's called hermeneutics. And so the art of preaching. So they always tell you, they say, wait to the end to give it a title because you don't know where it's going to lead. Let, you know, the, the body of work and then you can title at the end. And so I, I thought for a while this afternoon for a really great title for it. And so I, I just came up with fall, Paul's final defense continued. I couldn't come up with anything. And so it's just a continuation of last week uh, into this week. And so we looked at the first 10 verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 last week. And we'll look at the remainder of this chapter by looking at verses 11 through 21 tonight. And then next Wednesday, we'll finish this series looking at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and then on to the next. And uh, we'll never preach through everything and uh, you'll never know everything, right? And so there's so much to learn and I uh, appreciate uh, your uh, hunger for, the, for God's word. And that's an incredible thing. So we're going to start out there. And uh, we looked last week at, uh, in, in the first uh, 10 verses at, at Paul, uh, kind of the blessings that he got. God gave him these revelations. We know that he uh, gave him these special revelations of different things that would happen and bringing in the, the message and dispensation of grace. We looked at that last week. And then also we looked at the suffering that Paul had in his life, particularly uh, his was an eye condition. And, and we said that God not only gives us all the good things that we want in life, and he's been so good to us, but sometimes God puts uh, something on our plate as we go through the, the buffet of life that we don't want. And uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. It's a hard time. And we'd love to send it back, right? Uh, but when we go through that line, God says, you're going to get a lot, you know, some good things, uh, but also some bad things as well come in life. And um, so he's a good heavenly father and he knows what we need. And sometimes what I want doesn't line up with what he needs for me to have. And so in those times, I trust God. And so God didn't take away something from Paul's plate that he wanted taken away. But rather, he also added something called grace. And he said this, and this closed us out last week. My grace is sufficient for thee. In other words, it's enough. And so Paul said, because of that, I will most gladly therefore rejoice and glory in God. And so if you're going through something difficult... Uh, if you're not right now, you will in the future or you're just coming out of one or you're in one or you're heading into one. We all go through those times in life. Just know that uh, you can pray and sometimes God takes those things away. He's very good at taking away things out of our life, uh, problems and trials and difficulties. Uh, but sometimes he also says, no, th this one's here to stay, but I'm going to give you the grace you need to go through that trial. And God's so good. And that's what we have uh, as a Christian that the world doesn't have. Their line doesn't have that bowl of grace that God can put on your uh, tray as well to add that. So that's what we looked at. That's a short recap. We're going to be looking at verse number uh, 11 then. It says this, I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have uh, been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest of apostles, though I be nothing. Again, Paul's defense. He had gone for years and years with the Corinthians, doubting him. He had started this church. We looked at it last week. I don't want to recap everything. But in starting this church, uh, he had said, listen, guys, uh, you keep asking for my letters of recommendation or, or doubting me or, or you, you're kind of getting uh, sucked into other maybe uh, fancier in, in wit or fancier in appearance, uh, preachers and things like that. Uh, but don't forget, I, I was there at the beginning. For a lot of you, I led you to Christ or uh, someone that you knew or got this thing started in this faith in your life. And so Paul comes to his defense and says, listen, I've worked and labored among you for a long time. 
And you know this, you know my record. Stop doubting my love for you. Stop doubting my commitment towards you. In verse number 12, and this is where we'll pick up in writing some things down, it says this, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs, in wonders, and mighty deeds. For what uh, is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. I want you to write down a couple of things. And uh, I know that you don't have blanks in there. And so when we put something, uh, it's writing out the whole thing. But please be patient with me on this. And uh, next week, it won't uh, be like that. But the first thing is this, is the signs of an apostle. The signs of an apostle. And these are no longer available because they were given, and we'll look more specifically at this in just a minute, they were given to a, a certain group of, of, of people, the apostles, uh, those who walked with Jesus, who saw the risen Lord, and to Paul, and so they were signs of an apostle. And we're going to look at uh, what that means in just a little bit. And so if you'll help, go with me over, we'll turn in several places here, and always come back to 2 Corinthians 12. So first we're going to go over to Mark chapter number 16. Mark chapter number 16. This is the very last chapter in Mark. It's winding down. It's the shortest gospel. And so he gives the very famous verse that is a, uh, a similar verse to Matthew 28, the Great Commission that we often quote, in verse number 16. But in verse number 17, it says this. And these signs shall follow them that believe, uh, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up uh, serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after that the Lord spoke unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. And so as the apostles were starting out, he gave them these signs and wonders to show, and it lists them above there. And these are not existent anymore, right? Uh, there, there's no one, and, and we'll look at how it happened in Paul's life. Um, but we know that if, if, uh, if, if myself or pastor someone else was to, to drink some a deadly poison tonight, that we'd perish from that, right? And so these things don't exist anymore. Uh, but they did in those days. And so because of that, and it gives us the reason in verse number 20, actually, it says this. It says, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. And then it, those, those signs confirmed the gospel. It confirmed what they were saying. And so that was the reason that they were given for a temporary amount of time. And so um, we see that as the signs of the apostles. Now, what's interesting is when you look through the Bible, and I want to challenge you if, you, if you know the Bible pretty well, to think on this as well. There basically were three times where the sign gifts were given, these signs uh, where they worked miracles, basically. There was three separate times where it happened quite a bit. Now, not that it was the only time, uh, but when these guys were alive and around there, there was a lot of this happening. And here's the three different breakdowns for that. Moses and Aaron, Elijah and Elisha, and then Jesus and the apostles. So Moses and Aaron, they go, of course, before Pharaoh, and they perform these, these miracles. There's, there's uh, ten plagues, right? It was plagues to the Egyptians. It was miracles to the Lord's people. And they're doing all of these wonder and works. And you remember God gave to Moses, he said, hey, you can take that rod, that staff that you have. If you throw it down, it's going to become a serpent. And if you grab it by the tail, it'll turn back into your rod. And there's several different things that they could do, turn water to blood and different things like that. And so God did that for a period of time. But then when you get into the wilderness and such, uh, and, and then after Moses and Aaron pass away and Joshua is there, there's not these signs and wonders happening anymore. And so it changes. And then you get into Elijah and Elisha. This is first and second Kings. And uh, there's a lot of different miracles there happening. In fact, uh, Elijah uh, did uh, 11 miracles and Elisha did 22 different miracles. And so these are happening during their lifetime and that's pretty awesome. And then Jesus and the apostles. Okay, so why does it happen just at those times as you're looking throughout Bible history? Here's why. During those times, it was establishing three different types of covenants. And here's what they are. During Moses and Aaron, the law was coming in. Israel was becoming a solidified nation around the law. He gave them the Ten Commandments, but he also gave them a lot of other laws after that. And so Moses and Aaron came by signs confirming that, confirming to get them out of Egypt, and then con those signs confirming that the law of God, this is the way that we're supposed to walk in that. And then it went forward throughout the Old Testament, okay? The time for Elijah and Elisha, because prophets were coming on the scene. 
And then after this, what's so interesting is you have prophets after them, uh, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, then all the minor prophets, Habakkuk, uh, you know, Nahum, Jonah, Micah, all of these different ones. Uh, but they're not necessarily doing these wonders and these sign gifts and things like that. In fact, hardly ever. Their job is just to preach and to proclaim and to preach and proclaim. But he got it started during the era of the prophets uh, with these different wonders and miracles and things that happened for Elijah and Elisha. So then we come into the New Testament and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John giving the story of Jesus and his life, his resurrection, his death on the cross. And then after that, in starting this period of grace and of the gospel, which we would call the church age, which has now gone on for 2,000 years, they have signs and wonders to confirm the word so that it would get started, people would believe it. We looked at on Sunday two weeks ago that the gospel had gone all around the known world, that Asia Minor region there, by AD 30, uh, by AD 34, at the time of the writing uh, of Colossians. And so uh, those sign gifts got it started and then got the gospel going forward. And it, and it really went to a lot of places and grew. Of course, Jesus' ministry, uh, healing and different things like that to confirm that this is Christ and, and he is what he says that he is. So that's kind of interesting, three different times there. And so we're going to look specifically at the times when Paul had these sign gifts. So I want to show you two different places. If you go to Acts and... Uh, uh, oh, here, interesting thing. Um, you remember when, when in Christ he g gave his apostles and they went out there, the 70, and they came back and they said, man, it's so incredible. It's, it's awesome that we can heal and do all these other things. And then God reminded them, or Jesus reminded of this in Luke 10, 19 and 20. He said this, Behold, I give unto you power to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But watch verse number 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. Not that you can do all those miracles, not that it's so cool, but that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You know what's amazing is I was, if we had, we always take away the wrong thing when God gives us his power from it, right? If we had the ability to do signs and miracles and wonders, right? We'd probably use them in the wrong way. We'd walk out and we'd have a flat tire on the car. We'd just, you know, that kind of thing, right? Uh, or something was happening with the kids. We'd just silence, you know, like that kind of thing. And we rejoice about it, like, that's so amazing. But the thing that Jesus actually said is amazing is something that's open and, and been taken by every single one of us, right? Not that you could do those miracles, but that your name is written in the book of life. That's what we should rejoice in. And so sometimes we rejoice in a lot of different things. We take away the wrong lessons. Hey, ch child of God, rejoice in the thing that can never be taken away from you. And that's that you accepted Jesus Christ, your Savior, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he's never going to wipe it out. He'll not blot it out. You're in there secure, which is an amazing thing. Here's some Paul, uh, signs that the, uh, of these wonders that Paul did. If we go to Acts, these are all of the, uh, the Acts of, of the Apostles. And particularly the Acts of Paul, because it follows him quite a lot. That's why it's called the Acts, uh, or the, you know, the works. The Acts of the Apostles is what the full name of the book is called. And so in Acts chapter number 19, look at verse number 11 and 12. This is one of those miracles and signs that Paul did. It says this, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. So he took a handkerchief, all right, blessed it, all right, hey, if you'll just deliver it to that person, whoever you're praying for right now, mail it to them, carry it to them, right, uh, Uber eats it over to them, right, and if they receive that, when they take that, they would have healing from the diseases that they had. That's an amazing thing. Amen. Nobody has that. Right. That's not happening today. I don't care what TBN or Christian station you're watching or whatever else. Put your hand on the television or whatever. They don't have that kind of power. But it happened for Paul right there. That's a pretty miraculous thing. Chapter 20 verses 9 through 12 records another one of these. And this is a story. A, a, a kind of just a warning to not fall asleep in church. Verse number nine it says this. And there sat in a window a certain young man. He was, what's he falling asleep for? He's a young man, right? And so uh, his name there, Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down uh, with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Definitely don't fall asleep in church. Don't fall asleep in a church window on a third floor, right? And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him, uh, said, trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. 
They had already checked him out. He didn't have a pulse. He was dead. Uh, and when he was there for come up again, he had uh, broken bread and eaten and talked a little while, even till the break of day. So they departed and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. So they were greatly rejoiced in the fact uh, that he was healed. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. So those are the miracles that you see that Paul did. And uh, that's a, a pretty impressive thing. Again, they're supposed to be used sparingly, right? And so God taught these. He said the, the reason why you use them is to confirm and to show the gospel, not just walk around doing them all the time. It's kind of like the, the example I like to think of is if you've ever taken out uh, your, your kids when they're younger, if you've ever taken them out to uh, shoot a gun for the first time, you know, they, they stand in awe of it and they think, wow, it's amazing. And, and can we do that again? And they'd want to fire all the time. But as a good parent, what you're trying to teach them is, is that, no, we, we do this to train so that sparingly, if you ever had to in an emergency, that you could use that weapon effectively, Amen. right? That's what it's for. It's not a toy. It's not just you know, go out there and practice on all those other things. But there's a specific design purpose for that. It's not just, it's not always just for a joy ride, essentially. And so what God was trying to teach them was, these, uh, these miracles and such, uh, they're for a specific purpose. It is to confirm the word that should follow. First for the law, then for the prophets, and then for the gospel. Uh, the next thing you want to write down is this, is we see the spirit of the apostle. The spirit of the apostle. First off, we saw the signs of the apostle. That has passed. But this one's going to be a lot more practical. The spirit of the apostle. This is what every Christian, every minister, certainly every church worker, Every one of us should have in our lives. These are just good things. And they're available for all of us. You might not be able to pray over a handkerchief and mail it to somebody, but you can have these things that we're going to talk about, these next five things. So here they are. The first one is this. You can see a desire for close relationship. Look in verse number 14, and we're back in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse number 14. Paul says this. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be, a, be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Paul said this, I don't seek yours or what you have or your possessions or your money, but rather I seek you. I want a relationship with you. Revelation 3.20 is Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open unto me, I will come in and I will sup with them, right? And they'll have that close relationship is what he's trying to, trying to get to there. And so every person, every single one of us should desire to have a close relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ, with people in this church, with each other. And certainly every church worker, every person who, who works as a pastor or, or, or in a church should desire to have a close relationship with uh, people in the church. When I was uh, for, for a while, and this was in the 90s or so, um, I remember when I was growing up and then went to Bible college, uh, we made uh, kind of a, a, an error to one way. And I remember them telling you that uh, when you're when you're ministering to people or whatever else, uh, people had, you know, different pastors had served for a while somewhere and then got hurt or people had left the church or maybe they got voted out or different things like that. And so it became a little bit pervasive as a teaching to not get too close to people or to make uh, really, really tight relationships uh, because you're opening yourself up to hurt and different things like that. Also, uh, it was thought that kind of the closer you are just as kind of a friendship, friendship type of relationship, uh, that it would be, then you have less kind of authority to preach or to be able to be seen as a leader, different things like that, if that makes any sense. So the phrase that they would use is this. They'd say, don't let them see your feet. So meaning that if you were going to hang out, you could have a closer relationship or whatever else. You could take off your shoes, you could see your socks, but don't, take your, don't go to the second level, right? In other words, was the whole point. And so it got a little bit out of whack, for example. And so what happened was, is it kind of looked a little bit more like this. It was too authority heavy and too light on the friendship side of things, if that makes any sense. And so because of that, it was, it was kind of common and kind of comical if you'd go to uh, like a, a bigger church or whatever. And so one of the, the places that I uh, went to Bible college, they were probably had, I don't know, eight, 9,000 in their church at the time, which is a pretty big church in my opinion. Uh, they, would, they would have this whole uh, thing where there'd be a bunch of guys that were sitting uh, up on the platform here. 
and probably like 12 of them or whatever else. There were assistant pastors and stuff like that. So church was about ready to get started, and you know church is about ready to get started because the side door would open up there, and they would come out, and they would take their seats all over here and kind of a more uh, kind of pop and pomp and circumstance type of thing. And so then other churches started to do it. So you'd, it was almost comical. You'd go to a church uh, somewhere, and uh, they'd have you know a, a group like this on Sunday morning or whatever, like 20 or 30 people in the church or whatever, and then they would have guys that would come out of the side and sit up here, and you know, there's, there's only like 30 people out there, and everybody knows each other, you know, they could just wave at each other and everything, but it kind of got passed down and things like that, and so kind of the distance between uh, pastor to person, pastor to congregant, got a little bit farther than it should, if that makes sense, and so because of that, and unfortunately, probably because of uh, different uh, abuses of power and authority and stuff like that, uh, we kind of flipped the script and probably almost to the wrong way. And here's what I wanted to say in this. And that is where uh, it's super, super heavy on friend and relationship, which is good, uh, but low on authority. I just want to say this, that God has put, and I'm not your pastor, and so I can say this, God has put a pastor into your life for you to be able to have as a biblical authority, right? And I think that in our correct attempt to say, uh, it shouldn't be just strong authority to where there's no relationship between a pastor and someone who attends the church. We've pushed it too far the other way, perhaps. And so what the Bible says is, is that, that those that are worthy of, of respect and honor to give them that honor in your life. The Bible also does say that we should listen to the spiritual examples and, and leaders in our life like pastor, right? Because they will give an account for your soul. And so here's what God said. He said, you should listen to them. And in turn, their responsibility is they'll have to answer to God for the church and for, for how they've dealt with those relationships, how they try to help people, how they try to minister their faithfulness in preaching the word, all of that other stuff. So we actually have the easy part in just saying, right, okay, pastor, you know, what do you think about this? Or, uh, you know, wanted to get your advice or that type of thing. And so I just want to challenge us that what we really should have is we should have a balance between that kind of respect uh, uh, for God's man, for God's leaders in our life, and then also that friendship as well. This is a good thing to remember as well in parenting, uh, that if you try to become your kid's friend too much, then you'll lose that authority, and you desperately need that authority in their life because God's made you that parent. And I always tell parents, I said, listen, you've got, you've got two cards here. You've got a, a friend card and an authority card, and if you try to play that friend card too early, you'll lose that authority card. You won't be an authority in their life. But if you can continue to be an authority in their life later on when they're an adult, then you can have that friend card out a whole lot more and it's a good relationship to have. So don't get weary, those of you with 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds, all right? I'm there, you're, you might be there. Uh, keep that authority in their life because they need you as an authority in their life. And uh, that way you can help them to turn out right and then you'll have a great friendship with them. But if you don't do it, if you do it wrong, you probably will lose both the friendship and the authority in their yeah. life. And so there's a time and a place for everything is my whole point. Number or letter B. Not only should we have a desire for close uh, relationship, but also we should have a sacrificial love. A sacrificial love. Look at verse number 14 and 15 for this. Paul said, uh, I come to you the, the third time we already read that, verse number 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Here's what Paul said. He said, I have a sacrificial love for you. It, it pushes me to want to spend for you. And Paul said, I'm going to be honest with you. It feels like the more that I spend for you, the more I love you, the more I try to go after you and pray for you and try to work with you. It seems like the less love I get in return for that. Sometimes, again, as, as parents, we can relate to that. There was a, uh, a, a mom that she, uh, her son left for school. And, uh, and, and going through and looking at the house, she discovered a note that he had left for her uh, next to the, the, the kitchen table where he had breakfast. And the note, it read this. It, he had listed out some things on there. He said, hey, mom, pulling weeds, $3. Uh, washing dishes, $1. Raking leaves, uh, $4. Cleaning the garage, $2. The total, $10. And he had left that note for his mom. And she kind of looked at that and, and uh, kind of was at first frustrated by it. And, but she decided to write him a note back. And so when he got home on his bed on his pillow, she had left a note that said this. It said, ironing clothes, cooking meals, making cookies, bandaging cuts, nothing. Free. You owe me zero dollars. Love, mom. And sometimes that the way, that's what Paul was saying here. He said, look, the more I feel like I'm doing for you and doing for you and doing for you and doing for you, the less love I'm getting in return. And so that was the frustration that Paul had uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the folks here in Corinth. 
C, you can write this down also. He had enduring loyalty. An enduring loyalty. Verse number 15, he said, I'm going to gladly be spent and I'll spend for you even though I don't get that in return. What a great thing it is to have enduring loyalty. I'm going to read you a verse out of 2 Timothy and 2 Timothy uh, chapter number 2. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2 in verse number 13. It says this, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. And that's an example of Christ, that even though we uh, sometimes give up, he doesn't give up at all. I wonder if you should write down a couple of practical um, things if we, if we could. And uh, they're going to be related uh, towards uh, 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 parenting some, but they'll work in every single relationship. Having an enduring loyal, loyalty. Uh, or sorry, D, write this down. Uh, first thing, or last thing that he said here is similar co-laborers. If you look over at uh, verse number uh, 18, Verse number 18, he says this, I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. So Paul sent two other people. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? And so he said this, he said, also the people that I work with, as I sent them to you, they had a similar thing. They wanted unity. They loved you. They tried to help you. They weren't a burden to you. They didn't try to uh, take stuff from you. And so that's a, a good thing to have that unity amongst co-laborers. Not only with Paul, but also Titus and all the other people that he uh, sent to them as well. Here's some practical lessons we can take away. Practical tips. Number one, maintain a belief that the relationship can be restored. Paul, throughout this whole time, this frustration. And if you have a kid that's getting away... Uh, or if you have a relationship that you're losing, uh, maybe with a friend or maybe with a, 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 a family member or whatever else, you need to maintain a belief that the relationship can be restored. This is a great um, example bore out by the prodigal son. If you think about that, th this dad, right, uh, the prodigal son, if you remember, he got his inheritance, he left. And the Bible says that the prodigal, the, the dad of the prodigal, he would, he would look out there and he'd wait every day to see, hey, is my son coming home? And you can imagine, I don't, I don't know if he was away for, it probably wasn't just weeks, it probably wasn't months, it's probably years. And we, we focus on that day where he came home because that's an amazing part. But there was thousands of days where the dad walked out and looked from his window and then went outside and looked down that long road there in that path and looking for his son and didn't see anything. Maybe he said a prayer and, and no doubt gave him to the hands of the Lord and looked a little bit longer and waited and as it was getting dark, he figured he couldn't see anyways, and so went back in that night. And there was another day without seeing his son come home. And he did that day after day after day after day. You know, if he would have given up, or if he would have said something, or really blown up the relationship, there probably wouldn't have been a point at which he could have been restored with his son. So if I could talk to some folks that you're losing a relationship in your life, you need to maintain a positive belief that God can turn that thing around. Amen. He's done it a whole lot. There's a lot of people that we know that they've prayed uh, for, as I look around the room now, you prayed, for, you prayed for years for your kid to be saved or to come back to the Lord or whatever. And then God worked that thing out. Well, imagine if you had somewhere along the way, man, you could, we can get rough with people on the phone or we can say things we don't mean or whatever else because we're hurt and we're mad. And if we do that, we're probably going to blow up the chance for God to turn that relationship around. So as the parent, as Paul, as the parent here, Paul was a spiritual parent toward the, toward, towards the Corinthians. He maintained this belief. He said, look, I love you. And I, I know the more that I give, the less that you give. The more that I love, the less that you're loving right now. But I'm maintaining a belief and a trust in God that God can turn this thing around. And if you've got a wayward relationship in your life, then I want to challenge you to maintain a belief that that relationship can be restored. The second practical thing is this, is you need to sacrifice, but don't spoil. Sacrifice, but don't spoil. And this is in, in any relationship, but it can also be majorly in a, a, a kid's relationship. And that is that Paul, Paul also disciplined and said some things toward the Corinthians that they needed to hear. He loved them, but he didn't spoil. I love this quote uh, that uh, you've probably seen it as well, but it's it, talking and referring to parenting, and it's so true. This is this, prepare your child for the road, not the road for your child. Sometimes we try to get out there on the road and smooth it out and throw rocks out of the way and whatever. You're not going to be able to run down all the miles of road of life and remove all the obstacles for your kid. But by faith and trust in God, you could prepare them with godly character and morality and strength of mind and, and, and Christian character so that they could be able to traverse whatever will be thrown at them. 
And when we get upset with people and get upset at teachers and get upset at authority or whatever else and try to remove them out of the way for our kid, uh, you can only do that for so many years. And then it all really comes out, right? And so prepare our child for the road and not the road for the child. And the last thing is this, be on the same page with your spouse. This is particularly in child rearing. And this is the one that applies really only to that. But it's so important to be on the same page with your spouse in child rearing. I tell this to my class all the time. And so you probably are tired of hearing it. But um, this is a really important one. In fact, from what I can see in working now 15 different years uh, in this arena, there's three different areas in which you've got to be on the same page as your spouse uh, or you're going to be in a lot of trouble. The first one is, is God and just that religious belief that you have, right? It's good for couples to be in unity. Hey, we both love God. He's a priority in our home and a priority not just for one person, but for both people. That's important, whether your kids are living at home or not. The second thing is in finances. And we have a financial class going on right there. All the time, I tell young couples, I say, hey, if, if you're a young couple, you're just starting out, there's an engaged couple in there right now. I said, that's a great, great thing. If you get on the same page in your finances, you'll save a lot of money, but more than that, you'll save a lot of arguments and heartache. And I can't tell you how many couples I know that this is a major one for them. They're not on the same page. One of them really likes to spend, right? Another person's just trying to budget behind all of that mess. You can't do it. And so you got to be on the same page uh, financially. And then the last one is child rearing. God finances child rearing. Not in that order. They're all important. But if you're not on the same page uh, with your spouse on child rearing, you'll consistently have fights and heartache over that area. And so it's so, so, so important. We've got one last thing to look at and then uh, uh, we'll be done for this evening. And that is Paul's desire for unity. Paul's desire for unity. If you look at verse number 20 and 21, this closes out the chapter. It says this, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be any debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. He says this, listen, I'm scared that when I come there, you're not going to like me, what's going on? I'm not going to like you, what's going on? He said, let's, let's get some things squared away here and just decide we want to have unity of faith. And it's a great point that right expectations in a relationship can eliminate a lot of strife. So Paul wanted to set this up correctly in verse number 21 as we close out. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Paul said, listen, listen, hey, make sure we clean up our lives and live godly lives so that we have good expectations one of another. Inside a church setting, we expect, right, for each other to, to, to deal fairly with one another, to deal right, appropriately with one another, to do the right thing uh, towards before God, but also with one another. That comes out in our relationships. He says, hey, let's just ha have this determination that we're going to have unity by righteous living. And righteous living in a home works for great unity. Righteous living in a church works for great unity. And God's work can go forward when a church is united in righteousness. That's a good thing to have. We should all desire to have that as well. And so that closes out our time in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. So many good things there as we've gone through being an encourager and certainly a lot of encouraging truth that Paul has given uh, for us as well. We're going to take a short time of invitation now and uh, close out and uh, just... Uh, uh, doing business with God, whatever God has laid on your heart. Uh, I don't know particularly, but I know that God speaks in indiv individual ways to people. And so I want to just end on that challenge as well. And uh, thank you so much for the last several weeks for being here, for being consistent. It's been an honor and a joy and very awesome to be able to preach to you. Dear Lord, we love you. And uh, God, thank you for uh, your working in our life, God. Thank you for the unity that comes, Lord, when we're living right. Lord, help us, God, to be of one faith and one Lord and one mind and one practice, God. I pray that you might help us, Lord, to live with godly integrity uh, one towards the other and help us to have unity in the faith, Lord. We love you. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Altars open for several minutes to pray and do business with God. I encourage you to do that.
Amen. All right. Thank you so much for being here. If you, we're going to just a couple minutes early and that's great. But uh, so if you wanted to be able to uh, help for uh, the public school outreach or uh, any of the uh, illusionist stuff uh, there with David Korn, uh, if you want to see me, uh, I'll, I'll be here obviously tonight for, for a while. And uh, so if that it can work for you either in the daytime going into the public schools or uh, in the uh, evenings here on uh, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, uh, early in the month of May, then please let me know and uh, we'll get you squared away and situated for that. Certainly appreciate your help and I know we'll need uh, a lot of it as well. So uh, don't forget also on your way out, uh, if they're out there and I believe that they uh, they are, they'll be ready uh, for uh, more ice cream. And uh, so uh, make sure to help that out, support the cause. Uh, and uh, you can also just support the cause and uh, give them money and then skip the line if you don't want the calories and stuff like that as well. So appreciate our teenagers and uh, it's great to be in a church that has uh, young folks uh, all the way up through uh, mature folks, right? And so yeah. praise the Lord for that. And uh, we're certainly glad that you're here. And uh, we've got a lot of different events. Don't forget this Saturday, 10 o'clock, if you want to come to the funeral here and support Victor and his family, uh, we'll have Soul Winning Outreach at 9.30 this Saturday as well. If not, we'll see you on Sunday for church. Thank you so much for being here. You are dismissed.